Mark 1. Conversations at the speed of sound. Craft is, is in itself, so if you're not used to this sort of thing, it's a bit of a surprise. Okay, now we're heading into your shed here. We are heading which, into uh, my shed, and welcome to the abode of one blackbird. Wow, oh my, oh my. Yes, that was me, oh meing and oh myeing as QAM volunteer Gary Scott took me into his workshop to show me his full-scale uh, SR-71 replica, a representation, or at least the nose section, because his workshop is not quite that massive. And he, uh, you may recall, had described to us a couple of months ago his uh, project to create a full-scale replica of a P-51 Mustang which is currently on display in Hangar 2 at the Queensland Air Museum and to be honest if you didn't read the notice board the uh, the information board that described this as a replica for many people I'm sure they wouldn't even notice so faithful it is to the actual aircraft it represents. Hello and welcome to this episode of Mac one the podcast of the Queensland Air Museum Caloundra. My name is Gary Hills. I am a QAM volunteer, I'm delighted to say. And you're going to hear a conversation I had recently with Gary Scott. Now, Gary took me into his workshop to show me his current project, uh, an SR-71 Blackbird, or as I say, at least the the nose section which incorporates uh, the two cockpit modules. Gary and his wife Lynn, who was in the workshop that day assisting from a distance, uh, are both long-term uh, contributors to the Queensland Air Museum and we are grateful for all that they do, both as volunteers and in terms of contributing these replicas. And so I wanted to hear from Gary why and how he has created this full-scale faithful representation and what his hopes are for its future. So this is me talking with Gary Scott. Well, so we're, we're walking in now and we're looking at how much of, this, of the actual aircraft do we have here? This, this is the, the cockpit section, the, uh, the SR-71. It, uh, its predecessors were only a single cockpit. When they built this one here, one of the, uh, the main uses for it was uh, observation, surveillance and a reconnaissance. Very high altitude. and, uh, and Yeah, but uh, because uh, of the, uh, the altitude and the sophistication of the gear that they were using, they required a separate office altogether mm -hmm. and as you can see the the rear suite as I'll call it is the uh, is where the RSO the you know sort of the uh, reconnaissance surveillance systems officer uh, that was his office there and uh, it included uh, a, just what you can see there's a, a, a radar with a uh, you know sort of with a side sweep most of the gear that was used for reconnaissance, reconnaissance and surveillance is still secret, <laughs> surprising. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, a, there's a box over there. It's an interesting looking box with a lot of wires coming out of it. I have absolutely no idea what it was for, but the real one had one in it, so this one's got one in it. And you've got, ele you've got uh, control panels with multiple switches and buttons and dials how did you so this is taken from photographs i suppose this is taken uh, everything from photographs mm -hmm. yes uh, unfortunately i could not get one genuine gauge for the uh, for the blackbird so are there any blackbirds still flying no no they were uh, decommissioned in uh, the 1990s and then what they did is they uh, recommissioned three 
because uh, I think it was NASA actually wanted to do some upper altitude uh, testing and experimentation with them. So what they did is they they did a uh, an SR seventy one A, which is this type of thing, just mm. the, just the two cockpit. The SR seventy one B was a training cockpit. It didn't have the RSO's cockpit, but it had a peculiar bubble, sort of. That cockpit there with a, with a uh, but mounted up on top here, and it was a a really really ugly looking plane. But it was the only way that they could mm. they could have a trainer. Mm. Putting that cockpit up there took 700 mile an hour off the speed of the aircraft, so it was it became a sub Mac two went from a Mac 3 to a sub Mac 2 aircraft just by putting that on. Mm. But they were able to do it with the Bs. But they resurrected one A and one B for, I believe the figure was around $71 million to resurrect the two of them back to flying. And they were given to NASA. And NASA did uh, upper altitude, whatever with it, experimentation. Mm. And then they too became uh, redundant and decommissioned. So this is the SR seventy one A being this, represented here. And you've got the NASA logo there in, in yes, the uh, I, I, avionics bay there, I was which given, is good. I was given one actually at uh, at NASA. So uh, oh right, that came from NASA. Yeah. Okay, and and as you mentioned, I mean Mac three. This this was um, an extraordinary looking aircraft, wasn't it? Uh, shaped for the aerodynamics required for that sort of speed and, and uh, altitude. I think we're just what we should do is we just should walk up to the front of the aircraft. We could come back to where we were, but just to give you a better idea, I'll, I'll remove some of this paraphernalia from here and carefully stow it under there. <laughs> Very careful. Just watch yourself here. But you really have to look at the aircraft mm. from this perspective. From the nose, yeah. To see just how sleek and slippery this thing actually was. So was that partly a uh, radar defence as well, or was it simply aerodynamics? It was primarily aerodynamics. Aerodynamics, what uh, the guy who, who actually designed it, who was, uh, his name was Clarence, uh, nicknamed Kelly, because he was a very, very hot-tempered person. Uh, but uh, Johnson surname. Kelly Johnson uh, designed this. He was probably, to my mind, the most brilliant aerodynamicist dynamicist that uh, the world has ever seen. And uh, he's like, he died in the early 1990s, I think. And uh, I don't think we'll ever see anyone like him again. Is there anything else that he designed that we might know of? Yes, yes, he designed. Uh, you're going to be chasing my memory a little bit, but I can I can show you. But the I don't know whether you're with the twin boom P38 Lightning, mm -hmm. right? Well, that was a Kelly Johnson. Now he was a he's been with Lockheed. You know, that was uh, from since the uh, the Second World War. Now, yes, as you say, it's an extraordinarily sleek and, and, and beautiful looking uh, shape that we're looking at here. And this, this part of the, uh, or this, this replica that you have come up with, which is how, how long would we say this is? Um, well, it's, it's probably, a, uh, it would be uh, probably about nine metres. Mm -hmm. And about three or four metres wide. It's, it's uh, 3.4 metres wide. It's, it's, uh, I only know that because I've converted back from, okay. from the American uh, 12 foot, yep. okay. which was, uh, and the way that I work uh, these things out, uh, where they are metric and where they are uh, imp imperial or American, is that, how much did you get? Eight metres. Okay, that's okay. Nobody's going to quibble you, over a metre. There were big steps you were taking. <laughs> Lynn's just been pacing out the length of the of the yeah. Uh, aircraft. Yeah, well, one, one of the things is, if it's an American aircraft, I actually like to talk about it in the, uh, the measurement mm. that they made it. They made the aircraft, mm. so the aircraft has earned, you know, sort of the respect of being, you know, sort of quoted in its... But for people who, uh, you know, who aren't familiar with... Uh, 
mm. that old system, and there are going to be less and less and less of us, especially if the Americans ever go metric. But so we're talking about 25 feet long, roughly. Um, yeah, you're probably, yeah, sort of, you know, between 27, 30, I would okay. probably say. Okay. It's a bit of a guess. But you are only looking, you're looking at slightly less than 25% of the total length of a blackbird. Yeah. Now, just I'll, I'll just show you something here, which is very characteristic. Uh, you don't worry about anything falling down. But you, you have to imagine this here. Okay, so this is a very long piece it's of pipe. A pr it's um, a probe. Probe, which is yeah. working as a pito tube. Is it a pito probe? Yeah, it's a pito, yeah, it's a dual pito. And, yeah. uh, but that there, you know, sort of, that really makes, when that's on the aircraft, because it was, it was chromed, and I will chrome it to the best of my ability. And that's got to be four feet long, I so guess. That's, uh, yeah, it's not quite, but, uh, okay. but getting towards that yep. there. So that, that adds to it a bit. Mm -hmm. But you're looking at uh, 107 feet overall on the ground. Okay. And when I say on the ground, I, I say on the ground, which also included flying at, uh, at, at low velocities. Because what happened when this thing stepped up into its its high speeds it actually heated up so much that it became a foot longer it was 108 feet long when it was flying so it's incredible to think isn't it and so you've had to do all of this uh, from scratch you've had to this is, this is sheet every, metal and everything everything from scratch and this particular plane here i can actually take you in and uh, i have a full photographic history of the of the manufacture of this one here this all of this shape was so incredibly difficult mm. to mimic because you see it's it's convex on the top of the nose it's concave on the the chines these things are called chines which are like uh, side wings yes so and it's concave on there but not only is does it have the concavity over the length of the chine but the chine itself also has a curvature so the the you know sort of the the concavity is following the curvature of of the chine and you, you only have to sort of look along it's not a straight yes. line looking along this nothing line. straight or flat is it no now it, it looking as ha having seen it just for the first time it's looking very close to what i would have imagined it would look like when it's finished and i guess you are getting close to being finished is that right the, the, of the little bit that I'm, I'm working on, the little bit of the aircraft, yes, it is getting close, but I'm still not really visualising uh, anything going to the museum until possibly the middle of next year. Okay. Are you organising a group outing for your club? Maybe a reunion or even a birthday party? Perhaps you're planning an evening event and you're looking for a unique venue. At the Queensland Air Museum, we welcome inquiries from groups to visit the museum between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. and can offer a highly enjoyable experience in aviation history. Tours are conducted by our experienced volunteer guides. Bring your lunch and make a day of it. Hangar 2 at the museum is a unique and welcoming space. 3,000 square metres of sealed floor space, under cover, but open on two sides, allowing cooling breezes and ambient light. Tables and chairs located under the wings of our historic aircraft. After hours, the venue can accommodate up to 200 people with chairs only, or up to 120 people seated at tables. And we have played host to hangar dances, birthday parties, and even opera nights in the hangar. Imagine performing on stage with the oldest DC-3 in Australia as your backdrop. Contact us under bookings on the Queensland Air Museum website or email our Tours and Events Manager at tours at qldair.museum or phone us with your inquiry. The Queensland Air Museum Caloundra, an amazing, welcoming and unique venue for your tour or event.
Now, just practically, we talked earlier about moving, uh, relocating across to the museum to finish off the Mustang. Do you expect to finish this here, or do you think there'd be more work to do once it came across? No, it has it has to be uh, finally finished over there because there's a very, very high chance of, of minor damage uh, shifting the thing. When I talk minor damage, I'm only talking superficial stuff. So what rather than, than paint it here and then have the, the paintwork marred yep. by, by either rope burns or whatever because it has to be lifted by hand out from here, which will probably take about 40 guys. And it's going to get onto a Clayton's truck, is that the yeah, idea? It goes onto a truck, it gets lifted onto a truck and then it gets taken down there. Okay. Now I'm just trying to picture underneath here, so in terms of thinking about mounting it on a truck or a display just made me think. So underneath we've got that same um, curvature, that scolloping. It's, it, that it's the... actually uh, sort of if you, if you were to invert the aircraft, mm. you would have more of a convexity, although it's not a smooth curve. What it does is it, it's quite flat on the sides of the chines until it gets to the bottom. So you have this flat downward surface and then you, that downward surface then curves through the keel line of the aircraft and you have a return of a flat upward surface okay. on the other side. And is it your plan or your hope that this would be the sort of thing that a visitor could sit in the cockpit and have a photo? This, this has all been built to 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 handle people two people sitting in the thing uh, it's uh, it contains av and i have actually made a movie i fitted av into it in both cockpits um, the original aircraft had a five inch screen uh, five inches is about 127 millimeters for those not familiar with uh, imperial but uh, the, the five inch screen was just too small to make it worthwhile watching any sort of entertainment program on there. So what I had to do is I had to fit larger seven inch screens in it. So I won't convert seven inches to, you know, I'll leave it. <laughs> seven times 25 gives you the millimeters, you work it out. <laughs> 20, yeah, I, I guess, I'll tell you what it is, is you know, but it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. And so on those screens we'd be seeing what? Uh, I, I made a movie, it's about, look, I'm guessing about a five minute movie, maybe a little longer, something like that there. But what I did was I, I tried to incorporate a flight of the Blackbird from pre-takeoff checking to uh, the start-up, taxi out, and this is probably where this aircraft here is more impressive than any other aircraft in the world because when you watch this coming out you've got this huge great needle dart that you're looking at from a profile so you're not seeing any of, a, of its primary uh, area volume or area uh, which the sense if you happen to look down from on top it's quite a big plane because of the wings and whatever you look at it from the side it, it's not. It is just a long, sharp piece of pipe. And, and it is impressive looking when it comes out because it just goes on and on and on. So somebody sitting in the cockpit would be able to watch that whole takeoff uh, sequence. The, and the takeoff, the flight, it flies up to uh, the, the plane, could take off with a full load of fuel. Everyone says that it, that it couldn't, but it actually could take off on a full load of fuel. Now it carried. The plane itself weighed about 34 tonnes. The fuel load was 40 tonnes, so you've got 74 tonnes that you've got to lift off the ground, which is a pretty enormous lift. Mm -hmm. If you think of three great big bulldozers, that's mm -hmm. actually what you're talking about in weight. Mm -hmm. So, but the problem was, if something went wrong with one engine, while it was taking off with a full load, mm -hmm. it does not have the capacity to come back on to to, to to come back on one engine mm. and and safely land. So for that reason they took it off with a minimal amount of fuel in it, usually about eight tons of fuel in it. And then they had a tanker. They were always accompanied by tankers. Were either one or more tankers were there and they were assigned purely to the Blackbird fleet. They did nothing else.
And did it have ejection seats or an ejection module like it the F-111? Had, it had ejection seats. The ejection, uh, like everything else about the Blackbird, was quite complex mm. because, uh, A, for a start, you had to be able to eject on the ground. You don't only have mishaps in the air, and if, if, if this thing here was very, very prone to technical failures in the early days. They'd actually built something that was technically beyond mm. what they should have been building. Mm. And when something went wrong with it, they didn't have the technical capacity to uh, diagnose the problem and solve it. So what happened, you had to be able to eject. Now to deploy a parachute from a ground takeoff, you've got to get about 600 feet into the air. So what they've done is they've put quite a big rocket behind the seat and the rocket carries the, the pilot and seat up to 600 feet where on that ground ejection they would separate. He would come down on his main chute, which was strapped to his back, uh, virtually you know, the same as anything else, uh, but, uh, and the seat would just fall away. Ejecting from the service ceiling of 85,000 feet was, wow. was totally different because he would eject and later on, I, I will, we'll go back up here a little bit, I can point it out to you. Again, just watch that. Yep. But the parachute sequence in this thing was very, very complicated. In here, there's a six foot drogue chute that's behind the seat or is it built it's, into the it's, seat? It's built into the, 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 that, uh, well that's the headrest. It's built into this top part of the seat. Yep. And uh, there's a, uh, uh, an anerometer there which uh, measures air pressure. Yep. Well, and air, air pressure gives altitude. Yep. So what happens at 85,000 feet, he ejects. The same thing basically occurs allowing for a little bit of extra gain because of less wind resistance. But the seat and this here screens up these rails here and gets with this rocket, the rocket behind the seat powering it, yeah. it, it flies up 600 feet out. Same applies to the RSO. And then what happens is this chute here, now this parachute here is, is approximately two metres, so we'll say six feet in diameter, and it's purely a drogue. And to stabilise the seat. Stabilise the seat. Basically, that's just it. Now, he has a, I don't know how long, probably 20, 25 minute, <laughs> comfortably seated flight down to 15,000 feet. Now, at 15,000 feet, everything in this, in this plane uh, to do with the pilot had ex explosive cutters that cut things away. Yep. His... Seat, seat belt res restraints were, and his uh, what I call Ben Bow Yangs, their little cable winches that hook onto the back of your boot, and they explosively pull your feet back in right. to receptacles under the seat, lock you in place, uh, to lock the legs into place because yep. the yep. the earliest incident incidences of uh, mishaps with this aircraft always had damaged legs. So they, they put the Ben Boyangs on. I think that the Ben Boyangs weren't, weren't a new thing. Uh, I've got a feeling that some Sabres may have been fitted with what we... Ben Boyangs is an Australian term for a, for a Bush comic character. <laughs> but the Ben Boyangs, they get, they get explosively, the cable gets cut off, the straps get cut off, but uh, when, you know, sort of when he leaves with the seat, so anything that's attached, attaching the seat to the plane is, is sheared. He goes up 600 feet, comes down 20, 25 minutes, uh, sort of hopefully in, in bloody good spirits and physical con condition. He gets down to 15,000 feet, another mass separation. Explosive guillotine, shear, the, uh, the, the belts that restrain him onto the seat and he goes away with his parachute, which is there, his main parachute, mm -hmm. which is also strapped to his back. Mm -hmm. So he goes away then, and he comes down under his own main parachute, yep. 
and the seat falls separately. So, D Gary, the idea is to um, complete this at the museum, have it on display somewhere where it's accessible to people with perhaps a, a um, walkway or something yes, to get yes, up so into it so that people don't have to stand on it, and to have their photographs taken in place, maybe watch the little AV presentation that you've prepared. Uh, this is going to be quite fascinating because we're talking, we're really talking aerospace, aren't we, when we get to this kind of level? You, you are. You are sort of, uh, you're... You're on the border. On the edge of space, you're yeah. On, you're on the borderline yeah. of, of space. Yeah. And uh, no doubt the reason that, that NASA recommissioned those two aircraft for the high altitude testing is there's areas of, of that altitude that mm. they wanted uh, answers for Absolutely. some particular problem. Absolutely. And in terms of aviation history, I may be corrected by somebody who's listening, but as far as I'm aware, nothing at the QAM really uh, connects with aerospace at this point. All of our aviation is uh, is at lower altitude. So this will be a unique part of aviation history that we can look at and touch and experience. And uh, so your thoughts are perhaps, uh, you know, mid mid next year, you might be ready to, to mid, sort of make that next move. Yeah, and we're sort of looking at all angles. So one of the things is uh, because, as you can see, I'm... Uh, not 100% ambulatory. I'm not quite wheelchair bound, but I do have a wheelchair, which I would use on odd occasions. We want to make it also re at least visibly accessible, accessible to a wheelchair, which would mean yes. a, a ramp yes. here where they could actually wheel a wheelchair yes. up and look inside yes. the plane. A viewing platform. Indeed, many of our aircraft should have that. So uh, yeah, look, I, but that's one of the things that, that I've been I've been looking at in the design of the uh, of the access ramp mm. is a uh, it incorporates a wheelchair uh, ramp mm. to get up to the platform, mm. and then uh, access from the the main platform to the aircraft viewing platform. And I guess we can look at a cradle that's almost floor level, so it's not really incredibly high this, when it's in place. No, this is no great height, yes. but it is just just high enough, it will be just high enough mm. that uh, it would preclude anyone in a wheelchair that's right. from seeing looking inside. inside it, exactly. Yeah, so. Well, look, Gary, thank you. Um, this is only a preliminary. What we would love to do is, is revisit this story when the time comes to, to have this as part of the uh, museum collection. I, I, once again, look, it's just fascinating to me to think that somebody would go to all this trouble and uh, create something that uh, didn't exist before. And it's looking fantastic, mate. I just have to say, you know, it's clearly, obviously, SR-71 shape when you look at anyone who knows the, the Blackbird. So, look, thank you for talking to me today, and we look forward to hearing the next chapter in this story. Again, Gary, my, my pleasure. I, uh, I love talking about it. So that's our episode. Thank you very much again to Gary and Lynn Scott for all that they do for the museum. And thank you to Gary for giving us that rundown of his amazing SR-71 full-scale replica project. Don't forget, we are open at the Queensland Air Museum from 10 till 4, seven days a week, except on Christmas Day and Easter Friday. We're at 7 Pathfinder Drive, Caloundra, just across the road from the Caloundra Aerodrome. And we would love to meet you. Why not come in sometime soon and make yourself known to us? Thanks for listening today. 